Welcome to Wake Up TV. I'm Eric Curry. We have several stories lined up for you today. The Raleigh Wake City County Bureau of Identification has improved the way they're able to process fingerprints with the use of new technology. Plus, we'll share with you information about the upcoming library book sale. But first, in an effort to care for the number of animals that come through the doors of the Wake County Animal Center while assisting the citizens interested in adopting animals from the center, there have been a number of improvements that have been made there. And to talk about some of those improvements is the director of the center, Dr. Jennifer Federico. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Can you tell me first some of the recent, recent changes at the Animal Center? So we've had two major projects ongoing in the past year. One has been a security upgrade project and one has been the facilities project. The facilities project has been the larger component of the two. And how will the changes in the dog quarantine area help to uh, help the dogs and staff? So we've implemented many um, safety measures within our new dog quarantine area. Previously, we did not have enough kennels in dog quarantine to house the number of animals that we get in. Dog quarantine is home to any animal on bite quarantine, um, aggressive dogs, our protective custody dogs. So measures that have been put in is a re redesign of the doors. So if we have to move aggressive animals, we can safely move them and shut the door before our staff um, take their control stick off of them, which has led to a better work environment for our staff. One of the changes made, there's now a dedicated uh, center or room uh, for upper respiratory mm -hmm. conditions of dogs. Why is that important? Yeah, so previously we were splitting one room and half of it was used for upper respiratory. So it was always possible to take away that room. Now what we have done is taken the smaller old dog quarantine, which only had 30 kennels, and made that a dedicated URI room, and then made the 48 kennel room that was used previously into our new dog quarantine. So we actually helped two different situations at the, at the animal center. By having a dedicated URI room, we know that A, we'll always be able to treat up to 30 URI dogs. We've put it in an area that we've actually added a door to the outside so we can walk those dogs without risk to the rest of our population within the center. And just that exposure to being outside is beneficial for them getting healthy. Um, last year, we only euthanized one dog for upper respiratory disease, so we want to keep on that trend. How will the changes in the intake area help with uh, uh, the intake of cats and dogs? So previously it was one big L-shaped room and when you have dogs barking because they're coming in from animal control or the front desk and you have stressed out cats, you don't have a good space to handle either of them. It's very stressful for the cats. So what we've done is split the rooms so there's three separate rooms one for cat intake, one for dog intake, and then one for the staff to work on the computers and monitor the animals in those rooms, which leads to much less stress on intake for all of our animals. And how has the overall look of the center changed? So we actually got rid of a lot of um, the old colors, which were yellow and purple and green and blue, and a lot of disconnect with the new portion that was built in 2010. So there's a continuity throughout the facility now when you come in. The flooring is all this beautiful epoxy flooring which leads to better infectious disease control. We can clean it, we can bleach it. So aesthetically it's pleasing to the citizens, but it is also beneficial for the care of our animals. I know you're excited about the entire uh, change in the look and, and function of the center, mm -hmm. but what's the most favorite part for you uh, of this whole big change? So my favorite part is our new behavior room. Um, we previously had an outdoor court courtyard for the dogs that in 2010 half of it was removed for the new air conditioning units for the new section. So it was very loud, it wasn't very useful, and we we're doing a lot more behavior testing. We have a lot more, uh, many more rescue partners who want to know the status of these animals. So now we have a dedicated room that we can do safer testing. We can see how they are with other dogs. Um, and this space has given us a lot more mobility to offer that to our rescue partners and assess the animals coming into our care. Okay, Dr. Jennifer Federico, director of the Wake County Animal Center, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Stay tuned to Wake Up TV. We'll have more after this. 
the town of Cary invites you to kick off the season with a full day of holiday cheer in downtown Cary. On Saturday, December 6th, enjoy the heart of the holiday celebration that features a host of activities including Santa and the town of Cary's Christmas tree lighting celebration. Looking for fun gift ideas? Try Cary Theater movie passes, escape Cary membership, fitness passes, or even a Parks and Recreation gift card. Bring the whole family. It's the heart of the holidays in Cary. For more information, visit townofcary.org. CCBI was, was created about it was 77 years ago by the North Carolina General Assembly. And our, our mission and, and goals today are to provide a high level of forensic services to all the law enforcement agencies in Wake County, which include fingerprints, drug analysis, blood alcohol analysis, and also to provide assistance at crime scene investigation uh, at the request of uh, the law enforcement agencies. It takes a certain breed of person to sit at a desk all day long and compare what equates to little black squiggly lines. Up until about uh, 2007, CCBI relied upon the state fingerprint uh, system. They're commonly called APHIS, Automated Fingerprint Identification Systems. Uh, we then purchased our own APHIS system. Once we had our own APHIS system, everyone was able to work at the same time. Uh, we then implemented a policy that, uh, according to following the guidelines of the law, that we would fingerprint and photograph everyone that was arrested every time they were arrested in Wake County. What I like to refer to the to the uh, to the APHIS system as an electronic detective. It sort of points you in a direction that you might want to with some in a direction that you might want to want to look at. It provides a lead. This actually is a list of candidates that could be identif identified back to this. So that basically the computer has stated based on this known here, these different cases could in fact match this. And it's up to the examiner to open up every single list, so just like so, and then perform the comparison. This is an example of a, a known impression here that was obtained at time of arrest. This is a fingerprint. This is actually the latent impression, or the unknown, the question impression, that was uh, lifted and collected from the crime scene. So in this particular instance, this is what's called a reverse hit. So this latent impression actually has been in the database since August of 2014. So it was entered into the database. It did not hit, but it does not go away. It remains in what's known as an unsolved latent cognizant queue. So it's, it's a file that anytime anyone is arrested after this is entered, those known standards that are taken at time of arrest are then searched against this questioned database. And that's what's, what's occurred here. So this impression was actually put in during the summer and this individual here was actually arrested two days ago. So in this particular instance, it's pulled up and the examiner has the ability to enlarge the image. And then they, they actually would work their way through the entire image, comparing the level one detail, which as you can see here, is the, the shape, it's the structure, it's the ridge flow. And then, when then actually, they would zoom in and begin to compare what's known as the level two detail, or the points of identification, or the Galton detail. And what you can see, these are these ending ridges, ending ridges there, short or ridges or dots or bifurcation which is are just forks in the road. So the examiner is comparing these individual uh, points of identification, their relationship to one another, and also if you can look here, their relationship to the level one structure of the image. So here's an example of an ending ridge and you can see the structure here it recurves at the bottom of this. Here's the ending ridge and again this is the question impression or the one from the crime scene. There's the recurve there so you can see that there's correspondence between the latent or the unknown and the known impression. So the examiner would compare everything that they have available to them and it's at that point that they would render an opinion whether it's an identification or non-identification. It still takes that human eye to make that final uh, determination that yes, 
uh, this print could have orig originated from the same source uh, or is identical, the terminology that you want to use. And then, of course, that is verified by another expert. And then a report is written and issued to the, uh, issued to the law enforcement uh, agencies. The beauty of CCBI is the objective, uh, how we ma maintain an objective stance. And what I mean by that is we have no idea the relationship of this person to this scene. Frankly, we don't care. We provide that information to the law enforcement community and it's the investigators that then follow that up. We would write the report and we move on to the next case. And it works too that it just goes beyond trying to identify just the person who may have committed the crime, but we identify people who are at, who are at scenes that when we tell the officer we've identified a particular person at this scene, at this location in the scene, that person then could become a critical witness. Uh, over 60% of the crime scenes that we've gone to this year, we've been able to collect finger and palm print evidence. And of that, we've been able to identify, 42% of the time, we've been able to identify someone at the scene. I actually, when I started with CCBI in 2002, we had only one APHIS database, one search station, and three examiners had to share it. But with this, now we have eight or seven of these stations in all seven examiners' offices. So they're not competing for this resource. They have it at their fingertips every day, all day long. And it allows them to really manage their work in the most effective and efficient way for the, set, for the examiners. They just don't compete for this very finite resource. Well, I believe we can, we, we can increase the number of subjects that we're identifying at crime scenes. Uh, I think we, we've still not reached our full potential of that. We've seen more than quadruple that number in the past uh, nine years, and I think we still have, uh, we've not reached our full potential. People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium. If you're an avid book reader and you love a bargain, well we have something in store for you. The annual Wake County Book Sale and Festival of Reading takes place December 11th through the 14th at the Jim Graham Building at the North Carolina State Fairgrounds. With us to talk about this wonderful event is Ann Burlingame, Assistant Director with Wake County Libraries. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. First, tell us a little bit about the book sales history. Well, Wake County Public Libraries has been offering a book sale for probably the last 25 years. And really what's um, included in the book sale is the library gets lots and lots of book donations. And when we get book donations, we take a look at the book, and if we don't add it to our collection, then we will offer it in a sale, and then the money will come back to the library. We also will have some books that are in our collection that are worn or are being uh, pulled because they're no longer relevant, and those books will also be in the book sale. Now, what makes this event so successful? Well, I think really it is a partnership of the library as well as citizens and volunteers. Uh, we have over 300,000 books. This year we'll probably have about 350,000 books available. And those books have been given to us to um, sell and that does, you know, help the library. The other part of it is it's an event for everybody. And so we've really tried to make, um, make activities that will appeal to children and also offer their parents a big inventory of books to choose from. And what are some of the activities besides the book sale that, that will go on uh, during this, this time of the year? Well, um, on the first night, on December 11th, we open at 5 o'clock and we'll be open till 9 and that will be just the big welcome to the book sale and um, give people the chance to look at the books very first. Then on Friday we'll be open from 9 in the morning till 9 at night and Saturday we will open at 9 and stay to open till 9 p.m. but we call that family day and on family day first the books will be half price but also we will have lots of events for children and some for adults and some of those events are the bookmobile will be there we're going to have craft activities we're going to have music we're going to have um, different um, performers magicians and um, things just that really appeal to children so when their parents are browsing there's something for them to do too 
And other than the books, there are going to be other items for sale as well. Yes, we have um, also our audio CDs. You know, when um, we remove CDs from the collection, they'll be available for sale. We'll have paperbacks, hardbacks. Um, sometimes um, customers donate collections that we don't have that we will feature in the sale. Say, for example, um, DVDs. We'll have we'll offer those for sale too. And the pricing uh, scale differs as we go through each day of the book sale, correct? It sure does, yeah. On, when we open on Thursday as well as on Friday, the prices of the books will be hardbacks are $4, adult hardbacks. Children's books and paperbacks and audio CDs will be $2. And then the next day on Saturday, family day, everything goes half price. So hardbacks are $2 and children's books and paperbacks are a dollar. And then bargain day, that's Sunday. And Sunday we will offer the books for $5 a box and $2 a bag. Hmm. Okay, and how can citizens uh, take part in this event other than purchasing? I know there in past years, citizens have been able to volunteer uh, and helping during the sale. Oh yes, and we need those um, volunteers to help us during the sale. And so there will be a way to sign up on our website for the different shifts that are available. And really, when you're at the sale and volunteering, what you primarily are doing is restocking or straightening the books so they'll be more appealing for browsers. And how can citizens find out more about the book sale? If you look on our website, there'll be more information about the book sale, the times, the prices, as well as the special um, events that are happening on Saturday, which is Family Day. And Brolin Game, Assistant Director, Wake County Libraries, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. When we return, we'll show you a unique program that's designed to help teens become leaders. Stay tuned. As an integral part of Wake County Human Services, Wake County Cooperative Extension, and North Carolina State and North Carolina a and Universities, Wake County 4-H works collaboratively with these and other organizations to ensure that all Wake County youth have access to resources and can develop the skills they need to succeed. If a parent comes and asks us what their son or daughter can gain out of 4-H, I think the main thing that I want to tell that parent is that their child is going to know more about themselves, they're going to become more self-confident, they're going to become more self-aware, they're going to learn to communicate better um, with adults and other youth, um, and those are really the life skills that are going to serve as the building block to help that young person explore what they're interested in, uh, meet obstacles that come their way, and eventually to be successful um, as an adult. I think it's important for us all to you know, become leaders in the community because we're going to be the leaders of tomorrow as you asked me a second ago. Um, why do you think you, know, you should be involved in local government? Maybe I can be in local government later on when I'm going to have to leave my city or something, so that's pretty important. I think one of the reasons that it's really important for um, our youth to get involved with leadership is so that they can apply it later in their life because everything we do now is going to teach us and develop us into the person we're going to be in tomorrow and future years and when we become adults in society. And um, something that Justin touched on was that we're going to be the leaders of our towns. We're going to be running the businesses. We're going to be the ones who are supporting our families. And I think it's really important for us to develop those skills from a young age and get comfortable, get our confidence up, um, learn how to communicate with others and how to collaborate to get things done. I think the key with 4-H is that we, um, our whole entire program is based around what that young person is interested in. And so we start with their interest area and we work from there. Um, we have a network of volunteers and other youth and staff who support their growth and development along the way. And we help um, explore their area, their spark, and then um, help them connect to next steps to help them learn even more. And then when you get to the level of being a teenager, to do some service learning and really emphasize what you have learned and share that with others. I think it's important for 4 Hers to learn how to be leaders and to develop their leadership because not only will it improve their confidence, 
because they're, they've learned to communicate properly um, with others and spread their ideas, but they will also um, learn how to collaborate and get things done and build their own personal character. The easiest way to connect with our 4-H program is either to call our office, um, to email us, or to stop by our office, which is right off of Pool Road in the Wake County Office Park. Um, we also have a big social media presence, so you can look us up on Facebook. We're also on Twitter under Wake 4-H. This is the moment I knew his future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Welcome back. If you've ever had a chance to visit Wake County's historic Yates Mill County Park, you understand how valuable this property is, not only to Wake County, uh, but to its citizens as well. However, Yates Mill is also unique that it's supported by also a group of dedicated citizens whose mission is to continue to promote and protect this valuable property through fundraising efforts and awareness. Yates Mill Associates celebrates its 25th anniversary this year, and we're glad to have Rebecca Cope, Program Director for Historic Gates Mill and Crowder District County Parks, and John Vandenberg, Founding President of Yates Mill Associates. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Rebecca, what is the significance of the Historic Yates Mill site to Wake County and the state? Um, the mill itself is one of very few mills that are left within Wake County. If we go back to the time of its founding, it actually goes back to about the mid-1700s, about the 1760s. And as of the late 19th century, there were about 70 of these old mills that once existed within the county itself. And this is the very last one that exists still as a operable, restored grist mill. Runoff water power. The mill is also actually one of very few mills that are open within North Carolina for the public to come and visit and it shows several generations of milling technology, so it really shows you how food production and other resources were provided to the community. In addition to that, I should mention that it is one of very few examples of an early automated mill, which was invented by a fellow named Oliver Evans in the late 1790s. John, when did the nonprofit group Yates Mill Associates actually form, and what were the motivating factors that caused this group to, to come together? We got together um, probably at the instigation of the Wake County Historical Society. I served on their board of directors for a while. And um, they recognized the mill as being a uh, valuable resource, as Rebecca had said, for the community and uh, deserved to be restored. So we met downtown and uh, about a dozen of us all together so had interest in historic preservation. And uh, from that, uh, and with the help of Wake County Historical Society, we formed a, a nonprofit organization in um, 1989. Uh -huh. and now, John, when, uh, who owns this old mill and when was it purchased? Currently owned by NC State University. And that's an interesting story because um, the university um, really wanted the land around it because the new School of Veterinary Medicine was, being, was in, in planning stage and it needed a place for its agricultural operations, the poultry and, and, the, and the cattle. And so it got a little over 1,000 acres, 1,005 acres in that, in that area at a very low cost. And as part of that, the Yates Mill was a tag-along. And the university biology program, which, in which I was involved, uh, was very much active in using the site and, and contributing to it. And I watched this old mill deteriorating, and that's how we got started with the uh, Wake County Historical Society. Okay, and Rebecca, when did Wake County um, become involved with this project, and what are we responsible for as it relates to Wake County government? Um, so NC State University, as you heard, is still the owners of the property. They've leased the property to Wake County and we have a total of 158 acres with the university. We actually bought another 16 acre property, so we have a total of 174 acres, for which the Wake County Park staff are the managing agency. So we come out and maintain the cultural resources, but then we work with the nonprofit group Yates Mill Associates, and they are, through a use agreement, directly responsible for the mills, long-term maintenance and ongoing operations. And the public being able to get in to see the mill 
What are they going to see when they take one of these tours? Um, so the, the park itself is open a little bit more than the mill. Uh, we've got certain times the mill is open, but you can come out, for instance, and hike the Mill Pond Trail or go upstream to some of the other trails that we've got any time on 361 days a year, um, seven days a week. So the mill itself, we do have some public tours that are scheduled both on weekdays and weekends, and we also work with a number of organized groups. For anybody of a group of 10 or more, they can set up a customized tour time, and we actually work with Yates Mill Associates, volunteers, and other folks from the community who we help train and get outfitted to come out and teach the actual tour programs. Uh, John, what are some of the greatest needs for uh, the organization and the old mill today? Well, um, it's being old. It uh, requires a attention from time to time to improve its conditions. And they're all done as accurate historically as possible, so we're reflecting uh, the fact that the mill is, is uh, 250 some years old at this point. The other thing is that we have three legs to our stool at the moment, which is this partnership as the county is one of the legs, Yates Mill Associates is one of the legs, and NC State University is the other leg. So these three, stool, three, three legs, we want to put a fourth leg on it, and that's the corporate support. And so that's one of our goals for the next few years is to, um, to seek out uh, corporate support to add to the others. And I think my final question, you, you kind of got it going, where do we go from here as it relates to the future of the mill as well as the right. mill associates? <clears throat> First you, John, and then we'll get a response okay. from Rebecca. <clears throat> well, as far as the mill is concerned, we certainly have to maintain it, uh, and that, that, that requires the capability of an excellent miller. Uh, William Robbins uh, is in charge of that, and we then have uh, a number of volunteers who work on there. So we need to enhance and increase our volunteer supply so that we have adequate numbers of people to provide guidance to the... Okay, Rebecca? We do have some future plans as well. Uh, we'll be going into another round of master planning with our partners, and we are in conversation already with NC State University for two adjacent properties that are already under development. One is an agroecology demonstration farm, and then in addition to that, the Dairy Museum, which has the delicious howling cow ice cream. We've got the girls right across the street. The cows usually stare at you when you're walking down to the mill. Uh, but there's talk of doing a dairy museum and possibly some sort of a, a trail or a corridor that might connect between our site and that site as well. Sounds like the future is bright at Historic Gates Mill. Yes, we have plenty to do. All right, Rebecca Cope with Wake County Parks, John Vandenberg, the, uh, one of the founding members of the Yates Mill Associates. Thank you so much for being here. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Keep up with the latest Wake County news by visiting us online at wakegov.com news or on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching.